Welcome back to Highly Curious, everybody. I'm your host, Ben. Joined with me today, as always, is my two awesome co-hosts, Keith and Pop. Thank you for joining us. If you uh, have been with us for a long time, welcome back. If it's your first time, thank you. This is Highly Curious, the podcast where we talk about everything between finance and medicine. And um, we want to pique your curiosity. We got a great topic today. Pop sent out an email. And uh, me and Keith were like, well, we got to talk about this. So without any delay, Pop, take it away. Yeah, I think the thing that hits me, and I think everybody would agree, is uh, there are societal differences between different factions or different groups, really not necessarily factions, within the United States and across the globe. And because we're a smaller society today because of the Internet and everything, the question is, how do people really make decisions at the end of the day? And what's their basis of decision? And what we've seen within the developed world, but particularly within the United States, is we have shifted from the Judeo-Christian viewpoint of values, of absolute truth. There is an absolute truth. And we shifted to uh, situational ethics as we uh, closed out the last century. And as we moved into uh, this 21st century, we moved to self-truth. That is, truth can be defined by the person. And as a result, it increases proportionately uh, the amount of conflicts that we have, and there's no common basis for resolution. You'll see it between nations, and you'll see people have different value sets. We were talking to Kim Jong-un at North Korea. We'd have a different value set. We'd have a very difficult way of solving our problems or coming to an agreement because we got different views of the world. So it's pretty self-evident. But when you have that within a nation like the United States, you're seeing it perpetuated because of this absolute freedom that we have. You know, we, I think we see it a lot right now, right? Because it's amazing how a lot of that truth gets distorted or there's not an absolute truth. Um, you know, if we even Google is coffee bad for me or is coffee good for me, I can find support for either side that I want to be supported with. Right. So. How do I know that absolute truth? Because to your point, we're not operating under the same premise of what it is. And many times we manage by an exception. Maybe one person with some rare disease drank this drink and, and died. And so we say, oh, it could be bad for you. Well, no, the truth is this, this thing is good for you. There's a few instances where maybe something could be bad, but the truth is that it's good. No, we decide, no, the truth on one end, they're like, it's bad, or the truth is it's good. And we don't know where it lies. The other thing I would say, Pop, and you had mentioned this in some prior conversations, is we we find this very evident when we're trying to do business. And when you're within one set of, co- when you're in with one country, generally speaking, business is easier because you've learned the customary techniques. We know how to shake hands or smile or how to introduce ourselves or how to have our version of small talk to build some level of trust or rapport. We understand contracts and what signatures mean. But other countries, they may have a different set of values, right? And I mean, if you think that there's no real uniform set of values, I would still say there's still some uniform set. That's what separates the legal and illegal activity. So, for example, if we were in the drug dealer game and somebody decides to start selling some of our products, our solution could be murder. Whereas in the regular business world, that is not the solution to solve any problem. We would look at court systems or other things or we would just fear there's competition and we've got to have a better product or we've got to do something to stifle our competition. So there's still some things there. Now, what I would like to tell you and maybe just to put something to ponder and love pop this idea too, many times that gets very gray. And I do think that you said, pop, if we don't have a common set of values, we don't know what's gray and what's not. So for example, when I lived in China, things I would refer to as bribery, okay? So they would maybe say, hey, we're going to make this, this, this phone here, and we know it needs a certain uh, chip part. And so they decide to go have one of their guys in procurement go find the raw material to buy this chip, right? And when they do, the guy says, hey, I found the chip for $100 per chip. But maybe the deal was only 80 and he's skimming 20 off the top for himself. And we'd say, hmm, that sounds like you're stealing, right? On the flip side, I had this conversation with my Chinese friends and they said, well, wait a minute. If he was the one selling the chips for, say, 80, okay, and the company got the money, the company still gives that guy a commission. That's kind of like a kickback. Or people give bonuses that are on the percentage of either savings or sales or net income targets. 
this guy basically gets to negotiate his own bonus. If we were good as a company to pay 100 and that other company selling the chips was good to sell them at 80 and that guy happened to make a profit of 20, why is that bad for him to make a profit? Now, I have my own feelings about it, but the point is you can see how some people would say, well, maybe that's not bribery or what is so wrong about that? Whereas if that was happening within a U.S. corporation, somebody would be under the jail. Those are great examples. I think what back to what Pop said, what triggered me, it's almost like in today's culture, my rights end where the next person's begins. And I can't determine where the next person's rights begin because every person is so far out there on what their rights should or shouldn't be. And it's almost very blurred. And then, yeah. And then like what Keith said, I, I, I believe that when you make rules, you will always have to make exceptions. But in today's politically charged culture, we only make exceptions. We make the rules based on the exceptions and, and we aren't even making exceptions to the rules anymore. You know, you hear the, the abortion thing, right? Well, that's great. We shouldn't just pass the abortion law to let people choose what they want to do just because they might be raped or, or whatever it is. Let's set up a law and then let's make an exception to the rule for certain cases. But you can't just make these laws black or white, one or the other. But like Keith said, the exceptions seem to be taking more priority than what the actual standard should be. Yeah, but you can see um, just in, in my lifetime, I've seen a proliferation of laws and the number of laws. If you just go Google the number of laws written in the United States from 1970 to today, 50 years, you're going to find that that's probably five or six times the number of laws that were written from 1776 to, you know, 1970. And as results of having disparate and different behavior, we're having to come up with more laws to define stuff because people have gotten away with what's right and wrong, and they just knew it was wrong and you don't do it. So as results, we're trying to legislate. And we see that even in our high schools and all, we have some no tolerance stuff. That is bright lines, like you were talking about, Benj, that is zero tolerance. And then you say, well, should there be an exception? No, because it swung so far, they could have been with absolute rules because we don't have a defined truth. And you can't keep up with the number of laws that they're having. And the other side that we're having is we're now trying to apply today's rules or beliefs or laws retroactively to another time in our society by which they didn't exist. And as results, we're saying they were wrong because we wouldn't do that today or we have more knowledge that shows that it was wrong. Societies definitely make issues and make mistakes, but you can't apply that to the t that time because they just didn't know things. For sure. So a lot of things are coming out of it. So I think is if we're going to get along as a nation, I think we're going to have disparate opinions. I think it's freedom to have uh, different opinions. I think it's free to have the speeches. But like you're saying, if I know where your beliefs are and your rights start and mine start, because they have a common value, we cannot step on them. But if I don't know what your situational value system is, I might be stepping all over you, and I didn't mean to or no. So when we had debate teams in high school, when I was growing up and in college, we had rules of engagement. And you had to debate within, you had to talk to the other person's point of view. You didn't have to raise an octave. You didn't have to get expletives. You didn't go in there and have to punch them out. You just had to logically go through it. And what I've seen debates is when you logically start attacking these truths that people have, they don't appreciate it. And then they come up with name calling on the other end to push back. And they use other media and other forms to push it down because they know you're using absolute truth. And they don't want that because they're going to lose the argument. They don't want truth. Some Robert's rules of order there, right? To have our conversations. But yeah, um, so in Pop's email, he said something about you hear something a thousand times or you tell a lie a thousand times, it becomes a truth. Uh, I've heard so many things on uh, social media or whatever that people believe to be true. Um, and, and it's so crazy today. You, you can't trust everything. You know, people say, oh, you do this, you just take this and take this. And they've edited that video a hundred times. You know, you could go buy that same material. It's not reproducible. 
You know, it's, it's not like the scientific method would hold up to a lot of these things that we're hearing. A lot of times people just hear it. And if they've heard it three times, boom, it's true. And we've, we've stopped validating our sources. We've stopped trying to replicate those results. And as, as a result of that, everybody's right. And it seems like words don't even have their actual definitions anymore. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day and they're like, how do you, how do you, how do you define communism? And I was like, well, I don't define communism. It's in a dictionary and it's a, a Marxist view, right? That involves the proletariat and other things. And they're like, well, that's your opinion. And I was like, no, that, that is exactly what it is. Um, but it's so hard to talk to people because they're like, well, I don't view communism as that. And I'm like, well, I can't have a conversation with you because you've just denied the reality of what it is and what its roots are. And because you've done that, our conversation is meaningless. Have you guys had any experience with almost useless or just debates that don't even make sense because they're the person is so, I don't want to say this, but delusional or so far off base? Yeah. I mean, I think we, we probably all have found ourselves in those situations and uh, you know, that old saying of if you shouldn't argue with a fool because a passerby won't know who's who, um, right? Because you just should not argue with a fool. Um, but I would say, you know, Ben, um, there are so many things, even as of recent, that we heard and that we all believed. And I'm not here to say what was right or wrong. I truly believe people had the best intentions. But look at everything that was said during COVID of how almost absolute truth something would be that to the extent that we believed all of these things would happen or would, or we were protecting, or this was going to protect us against spread or that. And, and, and we believed it as an absolute truth because it was said so many times. Well, they, they you're right. That's is that they used the big word, the V word vaccine. Okay. So vaccination means that we can contain it. And it can be fixed and it can be. So I got a polio shot. I got a vaccination. OK, this works. OK, but this was not this was like a flu shot. It would only hurt hit certain strains. And as we got deeper into it, they used the wrong word. It's not a vaccine. It's a shot that precludes one strain. And that one may not mutate like the other strains would. And as a result, you got to get another one. Then you got to get another. Well, it's a shot. It's a flu shot. It's not a flu vaccination each year. Yeah. Well, and what I've realized is with all of this is if you're the person in today's society that says, I want to do some research on the vaccines and the efficacy, everybody would view you as a black sheep because you didn't just willingly accept what was force fed to you. And it's almost like the people that just want to come up with some logic and be like, hey, I just want to double check this. If you double check anything or even tell somebody, uh, I might have a different view, they label you so fast as a conspiracy theorist or a right wing whatever. And it's like, hold on. When did somebody just holding up their hand saying, uh, I'm not sure if this is right. When did that person become the outcast? Yeah, well, all those people that did that, they've been vindicated in my view because it really wasn't a vaccine. And somebody like me, I'm not a novice. I'm not even well, educated. I'm not talking about vaccine. Yeah, or anything. Right. Yeah, I'm not talking but about right. vaccine. I'm just talking about anything. Yeah, I mean, when did you're the right. person who raises their hand become the outcast? I, I think personally that that's always been the case um, in my own head. I, I think when you want to go against groupthink, it's going to be difficult. So, for example, I would have loved to have thought I would 100% have stood up against slavery, right? Okay. Now, if I rewind the clock that far back um, and you look at what it is, there was no internet or any pseudo screen name to hide behind. If you wanted to, you needed to go press the issue. You needed to go try to get legislators or other people to change the law, which some many people did to no avail and it, it resulted in a war. But I think about how many people before it happened to be a war, how many people spoke out about it and were probably lynched and hung themselves because it went against what the populist vote was at the time. And so my own opinion is group think is very powerful. And if you tell that lie over a thousand times and then everybody believes it, no matter what you do to come up against that, you're going to be outcasted. Same thing when, you know, we try to learn the world was round, you know, how outcast of that was. Same thing if you go back into Christianity or other religions, right? Anybody that you try to think outside the group think, 
you're going to be chastised. Well, I think the Greeks did a pretty good job being a little bit more open. And uh, there's no doubt people have had biases. and But when you had the ability to debate and talk, right, and then ultimately start proving it, then I think that's when you can actually get things going right without emotion, without emotion. That emotion can override stuff and biases. And we all have biases and because of the way we were raised and our culture and the group think that we are around. But ultimately, there is an absolute truth or another way. You know, truth is ultimate reality is the definition of the word truth. It's, it's the ultimate outcome that is real. And I think. There's no denying that there's ultimate truth. You can believe all you want to believe that there's no such thing as gravity. And you can believe all you want to that you can fly. But when you jump off that mountain and you fall down, ultimate reality and absolute truth kicks in. And there is a such thing as gravity. Yes, totally agree with that, Pop. A hundred percent. Right. I do also believe that um, some people do live different realities, though. You know, so so for example, you know, you think about certain items. A a very attractive, beautiful woman goes through the world differently than a woman that's not. The girl that's super attractive woman, she sees men going out of their way to stare at her, talk to her, flirt with her, even if they're married or whatever. And so that lady's view is men are trash, men are garbage. Look at all like, these men that have their own lives going on, they still come after me. Men are garbage. That one lady who isn't as flashy or as attractive or provocative never sees some of that same side of men and instead has a completely different view. And when those two get into a committed relationship, the one reality is, oh, I better keep my spouse on a short leash because men are such dogs. And the other one is like, oh, you want to go uh, you know, hang out with the boys? Tonight? That's great. I hope you guys have fun because she doesn't see that. So they live a different reality. Truth is, the ultimate truth, maybe we are dogs, uh, right, as men, but, but you know, there, there is a different reality that those people did because, like you said, Papa, what experiences that they had has shaped their perception. Right. That's why it's ultimate reality. Yep. It's got to be ultimate reality, not situational or point of view reality. So in the, on the quest to maybe find or identify ultimate reality, Keith, I have a question for you because I know Pop's answer. Do you think that knowledge is found or created? I've heard this question before, and um, I don't think I've ever really heard the the the, the answer. Um, you know, I think that I mean an answer. I, I could easily be my arm twisted one way or another. So before I even answer it, I'm going to tell you I don't think I've thought this out well enough. That's like that answer <laughs> is fixed. Okay, right. You know, but I think it comes through if you believe uh, in a higher power that everything is of that higher power, then you're going to probably believe that knowledge is only found because not anything that's been created has already been created. Okay, Uh, if you believe that, you know, we are continuing to evolve, if you will, in ideas and thoughts, not just of, hey, I created electricity and those ingredients were already there, but even I had an idea. Okay. Even if it's a bad idea, you know, did I create that knowledge that that existed? I, I mean, I don't know. I, I would love to hear Pop's answer of how you guys would answer this. I think it's a chicken and an egg, but that's my initial take. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I would say even if you are agnostic or an atheist, I would say everything that we have knowledge of has been a discovery, um, not a creation. I, I, Isaac Newton, they, he didn't create physics. He observed and discovered regularities within number sequences or in calculus. Um, but I don't think any, you know, going by the first, one of the laws of thermodynamics is nothing can be created or destroyed. And I think that would also probably pertain to knowledge as well. Um, so whether agnostic atheist or religious i think that that is how you help define ultimate reality is by deciding whether you think knowledge is created or discovered and i would say it'd be hard for anybody to convince me that it was created yeah and i think i think if you polled scientists the preponderance 99 plus percent would agree that it's found 
that it's not created. And they're just rearranging whether it's atomic structure or data to create something, but it's only creating stuff that is already there. They're not making something out of nothing. They're creating something that already exists, tangible or intangible. And as a result, it's an awareness that we're having of it. Yeah, I think you guys have thought about this a little bit more. I think it's very fascinating. What do you think the person who says it's discovered, what do you think their argument is? Well, I think that we're, I agree with him that it's, that it's, that it's found, it's not created. I'm sorry, created. Uh, I don't think. Well, I, we agree. Yeah, I was like, we agree. Um, if someone said it. I would ask them to show me something. There's, we can't point to something that we created out of nothing. You know, rearranging atoms, if it's physical. Yeah, I mean, in uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and a whole bunch of physicists talk about uh, the beginning and, and, and the definition of nothing. Nothing is a very odd word. And to be able to produce something from nothing is almost an oxymoron. It's just a huge, huge quagmire almost. I'd say it's a scientific quagmire probably. We know that we can't create or destroy things. And we know that even from a religious perspective, they would say, well, God is something that exists and must have been created, right? That that's This is where the discovery argument might have a hole in it, is because they would say, well, your God had to be created. And I would say, and the response to that is, in order for us in our three-dimensional minds to be able to understand anything, we have to have space, time, and matter. And the God that created those things exists out of, outside of space. He exists outside of time, and he exists outside of matter. So we can't apply the rules that we have here in our material third dimension to something that would be outside of our third dimension. Space, time, and matter were all created on the first day from a biblical perspective. Let there be light. So light is a substance that you create inside of space, and it begins time. So you have space, time, matter. You have length depth, width. You have past, present, future. I could go on and on with the trees or the threes that we have within our dimension. It's all very, very limited to what we have. And so you can't apply existing to a creator because it exists outside of our realm. Right. And I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah. I say it simply. My view is you we don't have the tools by which to explain him because we don't live within that world. So if I only have a ruler and I'm going to try to measure Alpha Centauri, which is 4.2 million light years from the U.S., I can't grasp that with a 12-inch ruler. I don't have the tools to measure that distance because I can't go out there and lay that ruler down between here and there. So I don't have the tools or the knowledge to put God because I'm not in that realm and to bind him within hours, which is also, from my point of view, again, absolute truth, absolute reality is uh, why I don't believe in evolution, because if we had that amoeba that existed in the pond, uh, he had to have the DNA that had all the knowledge on his DNA helix, all the knowledge of everything that's ever lived. And and then when he started bifurcating, he transferred just he kept some knowledge and transferred knowledge. And finally, one knowledge became a cow, one knowledge became a horse, one knowledge became a tree. But that means that first amoeba that was created out of nothing, okay, had all the knowledge of every living thing within its DNA strand, because knowledge is found, it's not created. So as a result, it then just bifurcated that knowledge to form all things that existed. That's a pretty kick in sale that had all the knowledge of everything that's ever lived. But you said it was created. If, if well, I said it was created. I think the Big Bang period said that it just happened, which means that it it existed with nothing and then it just formed. That's the problem of making no. something out of nothing. That's not the Big Bang. No, it's not. That's right. not the Big Bang that's theory correct. at all. Uh, the Big Bang Theory believed that all of the elements were there in some sort of a in That's some correct. sort of arrangement. So th even modern physicists would say that th there was something to produce to produce it. I would say, Pop, I have a bone to pick. I do think you believe in uh, evolution. Evolution is a new term. Da Darwin came up with the term descent with modification. Evolution was added later. 
I think right. it, Pop was trying to say that he doesn't believe in macro evolution. Correct. He probably believes in micro evolution because 100%. obviously we do change when we stand outside the sun. And so descent with modification I or being changed. able to adapt. I'm the same as I was when I was 20 years old. I'm, I look the same. <laughs> I feel the same. I haven't changed in, you know, you know, 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's obvious I look 20. Uh, I don't know if I could come up with a good debate on how something is created. I'd have to really think about that one. That's a great question is to view the other side. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I always think that when, when, when you're ever trying to solve a debate, and again, I haven't really answered this question or looked into it, right? You always want to know what your counterparty's like top three points are, right? So if some other counterparty has their top three arguments, what are they? And if I'm arguing with anybody about something, right, I generally want to know that. And so as we talked even about the civility on how we interact with folks, if I say this phone is black and somebody else says this phone is pink, right, I want to say, okay, well, tell me first, help me understand where you see the pink, right? So like before I'm just like, you're a moron, it's clearly a black phone, right? I want to at least understand what their points are. And I think that's something we always want to be able to do and to articulate. You'd want to have what's known as a PMS code, and you have a PMS code that tells all the colors within the range of colors, and then each 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 shade of color has a PMS code, and that's how you can cross international boundaries and say this is pink, and there's an absolute pink, there's an absolute red, there's an absolute black, and there's fuchsia and colors in between that have a code, and then you have a basis by which you can say it's black or it's pink. No, I get. I think, Pop, you almost lost me on that, but I kind of understand. I think what Keith was saying is hold up a filter to yourself, and before you just totally discredit somebody, just put yourself in their shoes and really try to genuinely understand their perspective. Right. And you should understand their perspective, but you also should have a basis by which you can come to a conclusion. And when you get you use color. Yeah, but if you're not able to establish that basis. Yeah, that's right. Some things you can't. Yeah. yeah, but if you're not able to establish that basis in, a, in just an everyday situation, then always be respectful. View them as 100%. a human, put their perspective up That's higher, right. and then we should then we should probably just learn to respectfully yeah. agree to disagree. That's right, because you should you should also understand that some things are not moral, and you know they're amoral, and as a result, it's okay to have differing opinions. It could be I like blue, well. It's a personal choice, and it's okay to say, I like blue. And the other person said, oh, you should never like blue. Then it becomes an opinion debate, and you can discuss whether you like it or not. But you don't hit each other. You don't yell at each other. You try to understand why you should or shouldn't like the color blue. But it's okay because there's no standard when you get to a personal belief. It's just a personal preference. And you can say that, but you don't say that it's absolute truth that everybody should love the color blue. When I'm pushing my point of view, which is personal, societally on everybody else, and I'm judging everybody else is wrong because they disagree with my personal choice. That's where you get into trouble. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And I and I do think that it just helps to soften and have some conversation. I find that no matter you know what your beliefs are, if you really, really, really want other people to agree with you right you first need to feel like you first need to understand exactly what their points are and then you need to be able to counter those points right versus shouting or as this pop said in the beginning name calling or other things that may happen and let's have a conversation and just like my response on your question about knowledge you know i have gotten as i've gotten older i have gotten much better at saying i don't know much about that I used to feel like I needed to have an opinion on every question that was asked to me. Right. And the truth of the matter is there's so many things that I'm not educated on enough to have an opinion. I may say, hey, my initial thought is this or this is what I think, but I have not researched that enough to have a solid opinion on where this should go. And I think that we all have to be a little bit smart about that and realize as you gain and part of gaining wisdom is to realize you don't have to have an opinion on everything. That's great. Yeah, solid. Oh, I like that. 
I like that. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Keith, you closed us out with some awesome words of wisdom. Yep. Sometimes you don't have to have an opinion to be wise. You just sometimes it's silence. That's awesome. Pops, thanks for the email. I'm going to be paying more attention to something, the things that I've heard over a thousand times and maybe determine if they're true or not. You know, there's so many old wives tales, right? You know, step on a crack and right. break your mom's back, all these different things, right? Um, so I'll just pay closer attention and then see where, you know, how it goes. So thanks everybody for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed yeah. today's episode of Highly Curious and we'll see you next time. See you guys. Bye. Bye.